wanted to uh, deepen the theme of contentment by talking about the relationship between contentment and letting go, uh, which is an aspect of contentment. Yeah. Um, so we're content enough to let things go that no longer prove fruitful or helpful to us. But sometimes we come to the meditation and we're a little too eager to let go too soon. And so contentment is quite a skillful way to first enable us to meet what's arising. So the Buddha said we have to understand suffering first of all before we can transcend it. Yeah? And so I think this is very skillful because otherwise if we sort of miss that step out of actually meeting experience, it can turn into a sort of spiritual bypass. Um, that's quite a common uh, phenomena now that's been identified by psychologists, especially Buddhist psychologists, that we have this um, wish, you know, and it sometimes comes from a very beautiful um, intuitive sense that there is something more, there is a real freedom from, you know, the prison of the mind, um, the obscurations of the hindrances, and we have this longing to experience that, but sometimes we're too eager to let go of things before we fully understood. So the first noble truth is that suffering is there, but suffering is to be understood. And only at that point can we truly let go. And I think it's also beautiful because I used to wonder in my teens, it was probably the first um, sort of uh, time that a spiritual stirring happened for me, and it was mainly due to feeling a lot of suffering and, of course, wanting freedom from that, but wondering why it was there in the first place. I had this sense that there must be some meaning to it. There must be a reason why there's so much suffering in the world. I mean, if we haven't personally experienced it, you only have to look on the news and see how people oppress each other. The greed, the over-exploitation, you know, the climate catastrophe, you know, and all the terrible things that have arisen already through that. You know, some people still say, oh, if it, if it happens, and it's like, well... If you look at other parts of the world, it's certainly worse than it has been here, right, you know, yet, so far. So all these things really made me question. And um, it was sort of a relief to realise that through experience suffering, we can find our way out, not by um, rejecting it, but almost through it, you know, by meeting it fully. Yeah, so the Buddha defined suffering as um, in various ways, but one of the interesting ways was he said it's... Um, Association with the disliked is suffering. Separation from the liked is suffering. Not obtaining one's wishes is suffering. And then he said, in short, what we take to be a self, basically all the attributes of body and mind, are, in brief, suffering. Mm -hmm. So that may sound a little bit pessimistic, but I don't think it is, because we already experience some happiness too, Right? But the Buddha's saying that compared to another kind of happiness that's available, these things are actually suffering. Hmm? So, I mean, suffering is one translation. Some people say unsatisfactory, you know, not quite satisfying, not quite enough. There's something lacking, you know, there's some clinging there. But um, he also said it's really important to know how to define pleasure and to pursue the pleasure, he said, that's within oneself. Right. So first of all, we can look at these definitions of suffering from the perspective of contentment. Right? We're separated from the, from the liked. So that means whatever we are experiencing right now is not what we like. So one way to um, solve that problem is to start liking what we're experiencing. Right? <laughs> and then we're no longer separated from what we don't like. <laughs> and also association with the disliked is suffering. Yeah? We don't like to have sort of pain in the body, ache in the neck. We don't like to have a wandering mind or to think thoughts that we don't choose to think. Hmm? We think we don't choose to think, but they come in and obsess the mind. So what happens if we say, okay, welcome? You know, you're very welcome. And actually greet these things with a sense of friendship and kindness. You know, understanding that they're not uh, saying anything about you as a person. They're just causally produced. Maybe you've been working hard. Maybe you've been um, associating with the wrong people, you know, and you realise that afterwards and, and have a bit of regret about that. So the thoughts will arise, but you know that you don't have to fuel that. You don't have to argue with that. It's like, okay, the thoughts have arisen. 
Can I just accept that and make friends with these things? So when we bring this attitude of being contented, even with the unpleasant, it starts to change it into being pleasant. So we're no longer associated with the disliked. Yeah. The other thing that um, he says is um, not obtaining one's wishes is suffering. So this is very beautiful. Because to me, this is it really a problem that we're not obtaining our wishes? Or is the problem having those wishes in the first place? Mm. Contentment can be defined as a state free from wishing. Complete fulfillment, so there's no more wanting, there's no more wishing. So how would it be to just be content with whatever's here now? When we're really content, there's no need to wish or want for anything else. Yeah. So immediately we're closing that gap between, as my teacher says, where we are and where we want to be. You can see that gap as the suffering. Right? And the bigger the gap, the more we suffer. Like, I'm here, but I want to be over there. We don't even know what over there feels like or looks like, but anywhere but here, right? So by putting that contentment in there, in where we are right now, we're closing the gap. So you could almost see this contentment as like a place between the craving and the aversion. Most of the time we're pulled by our likes, or, yeah, pulled and then pushed away from the things we don't like. Contentment is somewhere in between, So it's a very powerful antidote to those first two hindrances that we talked about. And in particular, this wanting, which he says is like now here, now there, you know. First we want to go to Crete, and then we want to go to Italy, and then we want to go to India, and then India's too much for us now, so we choose instead to, I don't know, go on holiday in Wales. (laughs) So we're always searching, now here, now there, he says, you know, seeking delight. And yet the Buddha said this isn't... I mean, there is some pleasure to be found in those things, and yet there's something much deeper than that. And one of the functions of wisdom is to start learning how to put down the lesser happiness in pursuit or in favour of a greater happiness. That's one of the verses in the Dhammapada. I did write it down. I think 290 um, of the Dhammapada wisdom is being able to let go of a lesser happiness in pursuit of a greater one. So it's like when we're children, we play with toys, we do certain, uh, you know, certain things interest us, but they no longer interest us when we, we're teenagers. It's not that we start judging ourselves for playing with toys when we were younger. You know, it's not like, oh, those people are lesser than me now. <laughs> it's not a moral judgment. It's just that our tastes start to change. And so the Buddha said we need to know how to define happiness and pursue the happiness that leads to really lasting peace, lasting contentment, yeah. And in the suttas, this is described as um, the happiness of letting go, nekamasukha. Um, the happiness, what is it, of peace, upasamasukha. The happiness of enlightenment, sambodhisukha. And there's one more, I think, the happiness of seclusion, pavivekasukha. So being secluded from unwholesome states of mind, being secluded, separated from craving, separated from you know, longing, aversion, ill will being separated from all of that. And at a deeper level, in the deep states of meditation, this means actually being aloof from our thoughts, you know, being separated from the thinking mind and getting into the still mind. And we go deeper than that and start to become so uh, at one with the object of meditation that it really draws our attention so that we may even start, the body may even start to disappear. So we become actually separated from this sense world, the world of the five senses, and start to go inside into the world of the mind. Yeah? It's very interesting that he talked about um, these things as happiness of liberation, or ha- Sambodhi Sukha, because these, he was actually describing what we call the jhanas, the deep states of stillness, I like to say, because it's not really this concentration thing where you're like, in one space. It's much more inclusive and expansive than that. So we can call them states of deep stillness, deep peace. And, um, and he actually described those as the happiness of enlightenment because it's so close. It's not enlightenment, but it's so close because you've let go of all this craving and, and um, seeking for the pleasures of the senses. And you're starting to um, experience something which is quite different, much more subtle in a way, but also more nourishing and sustaining. Yeah? And these are the kind of happinesses that he said we don't have to fear. The Buddha himself, after practicing austerities for six years, 
I mean, he really tortured his body, you know, to the point where they say he could feel his backbone by pressing into his belly. <laughs> it's pretty grim, grim <laughs> imagery. <laughs> and um, I've been to the place, actually, where he uh, practiced those things. Um, what's it called? Not Gijakuta. I forget the name of the place. It's probably just named after that period of his um, spiritual search. But it's very rocky and very kind of um, spiky rocks. Really strange. But you can see how it would lend itself to that very sort of hard, austere aesthetic practice. Um, So it's not a soft place at all. And at the end of about six years of this, he decided this wasn't the way to enlightenment. He wasn't getting anywhere. He was literally falling over with exhaustion. You know, unable to eat, unable to sleep, and no joy, no happiness. So hopefully no one here has tried that today by fasting or <laughs> overstraining yourself. Um, and eventually he decided to start um, following the middle path, right? This is before he was enlightened. He had already realized this was not moderate, so let's try and bring some balance back. Um, and one of the first meals he ate was this uh, rice, rice pudding. Kia, they call it in India. It's really nice with little cardamom seeds and raisins and cooked in milk, so it's really rich. Or it may be cooked in uh, barista oatly. Give it, give it a... <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't want to, you know, take dairy. Actually, it's really delicious. That's my, my one now. That's an advert, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> they, should, they should send me free barista oatly from now on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so he ate this really delicious meal, you know, before he uh, sat under the Bodhi tree. And his friends, when they saw him all nice and plump again, and you know, looking quite well, they sort of, they thought, oh, he's just abandoned the spiritual life. What's he doing? And they lost faith. But the Buddha said that he remembered a time in his childhood, um, before he was enlightened, of course. Um, where he was very peaceful, he was very relaxed, just outside with his father, and his father was ploughing the fields, and he was sitting under a rose apple tree, um, just relaxing, you know, everything very nice. I, I remember days like that in my childhood, maybe some of you do, out in the garden on a warm day. I think we had a little bunny rabbit hopping around, and uh, all the little wood pigeons, like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> this really nice, gentle sound. And as a child, you feel so safe. Not always. And, you know, some of us haven't had such happy childhoods. Mine wasn't always, you know, idyllic. But I do remember times when I was so peaceful, knowing nothing about what was ahead, about my teenage angst, <laughs> all the hard work of building monasteries. And, you know, you feel safe. You've got your family, you're protected, everything's nice. And, uh, and the Buddha had this kind of experience. And, you know, his father was ploughing a field and he spontaneously entered into a very, very deep state of stillness, which he remembered after the aesthetic practices. And the thought came to his mind, why am I afraid of that kind of happiness that has nothing to do with sensual desire? That kind of happiness is, is very pure. It should be developed. It should be practised. It should even be pursued. So the Buddha realized this was a different path, and that's what the middle way means. It doesn't mean some kind of insipid sort of place between, you know, indulging in sensuality and torturing yourself. It doesn't mean that at all. It's not some kind of, like, drab, bleak kind of, we're all equanimous and we accept everything like a vegetable. It's not like that. The Buddhist path is quite a passionate path, I would say, and it's, you know, something that has a lot of... uh, power and energy and so the buddha defined happiness as a uh, this kind of happiness of the deep meditation as one of his definitions of the middle way so it wasn't in between it was a different direction right it was actually a completely different direction a direction which takes you inward as opposed to outward onward always looking ahead always looking somewhere else it was a going in a deepening within yeah? And so contentment can really help with this from the very beginning in the way we contact our experience, first of all, you know, and remain content with that, into actually turning the direction of your mind inward. So at first, you know, for example, if you use contentment towards the breath, you start to develop this perception of the breath as a very simple but very beautiful object of mind. 
And you just allow that one breath to come in with no kind of sense of, oh, will I be aware of the next breath? Just this one breath, that's all I have to do. In fact, that's all you can do ever, right, is one breath. You can't do the next breath (laughs) until the next breath becomes this breath. So we just stay with that one breath, with this feeling of contentment and allow that contentment to grow. And contentment, as well as kindness, loving kindness, gratitude, it's almost like glue that sticks you with the object. It, it keeps you with the object because you appreciate it, you value it, so the mind wants to stay. And as you stay with that, the other things start to fall off the screen of your awareness. The thoughts, they can be there, you know, we don't have to push them away, but they're not in the centre. Yeah. So there's this sutta in the Majjhiminikaya, Majjhiminikaya 20, called Vitaka Santana Sutta. It's about <coughs> overcoming thoughts, overcoming thinking. Yeah. And there are different ways. But the couple of ways I wanted to talk about here, which relate more to letting go, are one of them is to just ignore the thoughts, just ignore them. Like, don't give them importance, right? So we learn to value different things. Instead of valuing the thinking mind, we learn to value the silent mind. Instead of valuing the next breath or, you know, I don't know, aims or aspirations of staying with 20 or 30 or 1,000 breaths, we make the value in this breath now, in this moment now. And because whatever you value sort of takes centre stage, it becomes important. And the other things in the mind tend to fall off the screen, so to speak, yeah? Only when you make something really important, like there's this thought, and if I can just follow it through, maybe I'll get to some solution at work or some solution in my family, I should follow it. Then you bring it into the middle. You know, you're giving it importance. You really believe that that's going to work things out for you. But thinking never really does, does it? Otherwise, the great philosophers would be enlightened. But actually, it drove some of them to suicide, I read about, I forget their name, but I read about one who was a brilliant thinker and just tortured by their own thoughts because it never really gets to that place of deep peace and satisfaction, you know, especially if we believe in those thoughts, yeah. So the Buddha talked about the end of suffering, the way to happiness, as letting go. And what does really letting go mean? As I said, you know, we can't let go of things before we've met them. Otherwise, we're doing what's called premature transcendence or spiritual bypass. I love these words, actually. quite mm. clever. <laughs> you know, oh, this thinking, I'm beyond it. You know. But that's not really the point. The point is to see how these things arise and how we can uh, work with them and eventually what leads to their fading, yeah? not with force, but just through cause and effect. So Buddhism's all about cause and effect. Yeah. So I've lost my train a little bit. Mm, yeah, the letting go. So first we have to meet the experience yeah, before we're able to let it go. And once we meet it, the beautiful thing is we start to have some insight into it. And when you have insight into the causes of suffering and the causes for happiness, you'll find there's this beautiful capacity that we seem to have as human beings. We have a natural inclination to happiness, don't we? We don't really want to suffer. So when we see how we're making ourselves suffer, that's at least 50% of the work, probably more. Yeah. But still, the Buddha taught skillful means as to how to let go. And I, I just wanted to go through the way it's described in the Third Noble Truth because it's very beautiful. So the First Noble Truth is the truth of suffering. The second is the cause of suffering. Yeah. And the cause of suffering is, in brief, this wanting, craving. Of course, if you want, it means you're lacking. You are literally in want of something, you know. And so the third noble truth was was letting go of that very same craving, yeah, closing the gap between where you are and where you want to be. And he talked about four ways of letting go. And they're very beautiful, not entirely passive either. Um, and the first one is called chaga. It means uh, giving <coughs> or giving away. You could say giving up, yeah? It's a movement of mind that's the opposite of grasping, of getting, yeah? Sometimes we say that um, upadana means attachment. You know, there's always this word attachment in Buddhism, but it actually means picking up, you know, taking something up. 
Whereas putting something down is the opposite, right? So it's not so much attachment and detachment. It's more like taking something up, grasping something. And the opposite of that is putting it down or giving it away, yeah? letting it go. So this giving is very beautiful, not only as something you can do in daily life in terms of generosity, bringing more kindness to your life, thinking of others, how you can serve. You know, These are all ways that have even been proven to help people come out of depression. You know, quite recently I met a friend, a Canadian friend, and his dad was a psychiatrist and quite a renowned one who'd studied with some great um, psychiatrists, I think, in France. He, was, he passed away a few years ago, so he was about probably, he would have been about 90 by now. And he was quite cutting edge because he realised in his profession that what people really needed more than anything was just someone to listen. And he used to listen. And he said that one of the best prescriptions he could give, sometimes he gave placebos, which is probably a bit naughty, I don't know, but somehow he could get away with that. So he'd tell them to take some medicines, but they were actually placebos, like not, not, med- not actually the medicines that he said they were, right? They didn't do anything, basically. And instead of that, he'd prescribe exercise, so like we just did the lovely tapping and got all the sort of stimulation going, the immune system going. And the other one was service. So he'd say, go and serve, do some charity work. And I said to my friend, wow, that's exactly what my teacher says as well, Ajahn Brahm. He always says to people when they're depressed, go and help someone else. Really beautiful. So it's this sense, because I think with something like a very consolidated, sort of heavy um, state of mind, whether it's anger, depression, whatever it is, it can become very set in. Um, And there's a very strong sense of self around that. You know, I am the one who's depressed and we become very inward. I mean, I've suffered with depression myself, so, you know, I'm not saying that you know, there's something wrong with us for that or that it's some kind of egotistical thing. I mean, it happens, you know, and at that time we don't have much energy, so we we are very withdrawn. But I think one way of coming out of that is to start to realise there's other people too who are going through similar, right, and who I can help. And that can give us that sense of meaning again. And though even though my mind is unhappy, my body may be tired, I don't have to let that control everything. I can still be of service and of benefit to others. You know. So this is very useful when we start seeing that these things are not actually who I am. They're not fixed, they're not lasting. And uh, they don't mean anything about you as a person. You can still you know, be of benefit in the world and keep on cultivating the wholesome qualities. So this first one can include any kind of giving, you know, and, um, and this is the kind of whole thrust of the path. It underlies the whole thing. We're giving our attention in our meditation, yeah? We're giving our time. Sometimes you feel it's getting nowhere, but at least you're sitting, you're giving this time just out of respect for the Buddha or the teachers that you've had, or just to give it a chance, you know? Why not? Just five minutes, doesn't matter. Do it for someone else, if not for yourself. <laughs> just take a break. So giving is the first one. And then the second one is called patinisaga, which means literally kind of throwing things away. And again, not in any sort of negative way, but just like we don't need this anymore, you know? How many negative self-perceptions do we have? Or inner tyrannical voices do we have going on? It's like, can we just sort of see that these are not in our benefit and, and think about just putting it down, you know, throwing it away? Again, not giving it too much attention or believing in it. And the word nisaga, like, I think it's saga, actually. There's a lot of Pali words that are the same with the same ending, and they all mean a kind of letting go. So there's a word vosaga, which is very similar. And the Buddha said that if you make this movement of the mind, of giving up, of letting go, the main thing, then the mind will easily become still, samadhi. Yeah, it will easily enter samadhi. It will easily become one-pointed. Another strange translation, I prefer to say, I don't know. Hmm, it's not really a point, it's more that it, be, it, it becomes, rather than a diversity of things going on in the mind, there's more of a unity. So it's not a narrow thing, it's not that you know we're excluding everything else, but after a while when we've met our inner world, we start to calm down with it, stay still with it, and things start to fade, things start to settle, so that everything becomes simpler. We start to simplify the contents of our mind. 
until you know the body is so still that it starts to fade and the breath becomes the main object it's the one thing that's still moving right it's the thing that may come to mind as and and take your attention and so we allow our minds to absorb into that so we can't it becomes one pointed in the sense of one object if you like yeah so this letting go is kind of the whole thrust of that and uh, my teacher has a really lovely analogy for for this uh, throwing away or letting go he said it's like a hot air balloon and you're sort of on the ground ready for takeoff i've never been in one but it sounds cool and uh, the fire starts, you know, and you start to go up, you start to go up. But after a while, you realise you're not going any higher. So you think, oh, what shall I do? You know, we're not going any higher up. So in order to go higher, you have to chuck out some of the ballast, yeah, chuck it out. And then you fly a bit higher. And you keep going up, you keep going up. And then again, you reach a kind of plateau. So what do you do at that point? And it gets a bit scary. So he says, oh, now you throw off the basket. <laughs> you can see that as the body or something, right? <laughs> and then you carry on, you carry on, and after a while, what do we do now? Throw yourself out. <laughs> so eventually, you know, it doesn't mean like we um, do anything dodgy to ourselves. It just means that we stop identifying with the phenomena as me, mine, and a self. So we stop this clinging to ourself as the centre of the universe and start to be able to let go of that a little bit as well. And, of course, when you go higher in the balloon, it's also um, it's more pleasant, it's lighter, but you also have a much, much better view, right? So when you go up higher, you have a perspective on things. You know, we move away a little bit from over-identifying with the feelings, with our emotions, with our perceptions... All these things we take to be a self. Perception's an interesting one. Sanya. The Buddha said it's like a mirage. (laughs) So we think we see something, but really we're seeing probably something quite different. You know, mirage, like I always think of the water on the road. We think it's water, and when you get closer, you realise it's concrete. It's just the sun made it look like liquid. And this is the case with all our perceptions, really. They're so conditioned. As I said earlier, you know, we often only let those perceptions in that reinforce our views and, and yeah, opinions. Right? So often you read the newspaper and they present opinion as fact. Right? You read two different newspapers, I, mean, I don't have to explain, <laughs> and you have two completely different worldviews, yeah, two completely different ways of looking at things and people who cannot help but fight or just try to avoid each other because they've been conditioned completely differently. You know, so we have to be careful how we're conditioned. And you know, perceptions can't be relied upon, they're unreliable. Um, but this also means that we have a little bit of leeway to choose perceptions that are leading in a skillful direction. So if we can't depend on any of them as being really real and actual, why not just choose the ones that lead to our happiness? Yeah. I remember when I was a teenager, I was kind of quite, I don't know, I was a bit sort of narky and a bit like, <laughs> about everything. Um, and my mum used to say, you're so clever because you get, you know, good grades at school. And I'd be like, that's not clever. What's that got to do with clever? You know, just being able to like repeat things that you had learned. And <laughs> I had a bit of an attitude, I suppose. <laughs> but I remember thinking, what is intelligence really? And now I look back, I think, well, that's quite wise, actually, because I thought, hmm, it's ways of looking at the world that lead to happiness. And actually, I think that's a really good definition, (laughs) you know, because we can choose to look at things a different way. A really good way to work with perception or to understand how perception is sort of malleable, flexible, is to do practices like loving-kindness. Yeah, because when we have a mind of loving-kindness, and this is a cultivation, you know, there are methods to sort of um, um, encourage these states, right, states of loving kindness. When you have a mind of loving kindness, the way you look at your life is totally different from when you wake up in a grumpy mood, for example, on the wrong side of bed. You start to look at your past in a really positive light. Even the things that went wrong, <coughs> oh, you know, that had to happen really, I learned a lot, and if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have met this person, and 
gone on to do this degree or, you know, travelled to India. But then when you wake up in a different mood, I don't know, maybe somebody has shouted at you, you look at your past, there's all these incidents of people not liking you or falling out with people and all the times you've lost friends and, and these are all the things that stand out, right? So you start to see that, gosh, you know, the way we look at things, the way we perceive ourselves and others really depends on our state of mind now. And we have some influence over that. <laughs> yeah? When we have a mind of loving kindness, the future looks much brighter too. I know for me with the project, you know, when I'm resourced, I feel like, oh, why not buy a big property in the countryside, you know, why not? I mean, we could just give it a go and see what happens. But then when I'm really tired, I just think, oh, that's impossible because it would be just more work for me. You know, it'll wear me to the ground and then I'll end up disrobing and I won't be able to do it. Ah! <laughs> totally different perception. So which one's true? You know, you could say neither are really true. And it's probably not a good idea to sort of make decisions based on sort of perceptions that don't sustain themselves for quite a bit <laughs> over time and sort of are proven over time so I still won't buy the big country house yet but um, but yeah having the more positive perceptions definitely gives you more of a sense of being resourced and able to make uh, effective decisions in life I think and so why don't we choose those types of perceptions or at least be careful and don't buy into the negative ones like don't give them too much authority yeah because we just end up sort of digging ourselves into a hole so I find it really helpful to just remember, doubt your perception. Doubt your perception. You know, you don't know. Not sure. I think Ajahn Chah used to say, not sure, not certain. That's also another translation of impermanence, anicca. It can mean impermanent, but it can also mean um, unreliable or uncertain. Uh, not really sure. And it's a great sort of don't-know mind which keeps you exploring, keeps you investigating. And um, keeps that sense of curiosity alive. Mm. So I think I only got onto the second one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll go through the last two just quickly. And the third one is freeing. It's called mutti, which means uh, like, uh, yeah, freedom or freeing. So again, freeing ourselves from things, attitudes, perceptions that don't help us in any way. Mm. Ajahn Brown said it's like the freedom from desire as opposed to the freedom of desire. You know, in the Western world, especially in America, they say the land of the free or whatever. And it's like free to do whatever I want whenever I want to. But is that really freedom? I mean, after a while, you're just so confused by all the different choices. It's actually quite tyrannical. Sometimes it's much nicer to be a monastic and not to have too many choices over what you eat, over very much at all. I can't go shopping and get confused by the supermarket aisles and all the different types of washing up liquid. I just take what comes. And because of that, I'm free from desire for those things. I really appreciate whatever comes, you know, whatever kind of food people offer. It's just a total gift. Because I had no expectation. You know? I had no sort of preference, apart from it has to be like suitable for my health. But even if it's not, sometimes I eat it because there's so much love in it. <laughs> I feel like that's the super ingredient. So I eat it anyway. And this is really lovely, you know. And so you start to appreciate what you do have. One of my really close friends, she came to India years and years ago when I was studying Pali there. And uh, it was her birthday one day. And uh, we managed to get hold of a bo some boiled sweets. Normally we just have fruit and stuff. And I said, well, here's a sweet. And she opened it and she said... I'm so happy, I'm 30 years old and I can still be so content with one sweet. <laughs> and it was like a real sense of like joy in that sense of being satisfied and content with, you know, simple pleasures. Yeah? If we can be content with that little, then we can work less. <laughs> we can have a smaller house, more time to meditate. <laughs> yeah, you don't need so much. You can have one robe if you want, anyone. <laughs> Yeah, so we try and simplify. And if we can't, we're content with that too, because my life can be quite complicated. So I free myself from wishing that I was in the forest somewhere, and I just allow myself to focus on what's in front of me. Yeah. That's the way I manage with all my work. 
And then the last one, which is really lovely, is called Analia, and it literally means, um, like, Alia is like a resting place, like Himalaya, like the abode of snow, it means. So it's like an abode, a place where things stick or rest or are stored up. So Analia means, like, no um, storing, no resting place, no um, abode, if you like. So it's almost like there's nowhere for things to stick. So somebody calls you a dog, Ajahn Chah says, look behind you and check out if you've got a tail. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't let it stick. You know, you can say, okay, well, is there something true about that? If so, maybe use it. If not, let it go. Don't let it stick. The Buddha also said, like, people can address you in all kinds of ways. Their speech can be timely or untimely, gentle or harsh, with loving kindness, or with a mind of hate. Sounds very dramatic, but it can happen, you know. Um, And he said, in this situation, we have to make the determination that I will remain compassionate for their welfare. I will not utter hurtful words, and I will harbour no hateful thoughts. It's quite a training, isn't it? But it's this idea of being able to, you know, accept the praise and the blame, and but not really let it stick. It actually says more about the other person than it says about us. I mean, in my role now, I get I haven't had too much blame, but then I also don't put up for like comments on the YouTube channel because <laughs> I don't see the point. It'll only like deter me if there's negative comments. But then sometimes people give me a lot of praise, and if I wanted to, I could buy into that. But after a while, you realise, wow, it really is just that person expressing the contents of their mind at that particular time. And it's very lovely to hear praise because it shows me that that person's in a good place and they're feeling generous. You know? But if I, if I hold on to that and say, oh, you know, that's really good. Um, actually, it's really stressful for me because the next time I come, I think, oh, now I've got to, be really, you know, I've got to please everyone again. <laughs> so this idea of being able to just, yeah, go with the flow a little bit, you know, and not allow these things to stick. Yeah. It's the simile of the lotus as well. I should stop it with all these similes. But, yeah, <laughs> apparently a lotus flower, just things just roll off it so they don't really stick. And it just comes out of the mud, you know, out of the water and into the sunshine. And the water just rolls off and it blooms beautifully. Actually, as a result of the mud. Thich Nhat Hanh says, no mud, no lotus. <laughs> so we have to accept the suffering as well and allow it to... Help us generate and develop compassion. Yeah, so much compassion that we can start to accept the difficulties, but also let things go when they're not helping us anymore and they don't serve any purpose other than to um, put you down. You know, we put ourselves down a lot, and when we do that, we can't really be of much service to others. So that's enough from me. <laughs> And we now have some time for another meditation. So, uh, so I'm just going to start by a little visualization or imagination exercise. To see if we can evoke some feelings of contentment, a sort of spacious sense of allowing things to arise and pass away according to their own nature. So if you wish to follow, you're most welcome. If not, you may allow the words to fall off the screen and just carry on practicing in your usual way. So as we begin, again, just welcoming our body into this space, onto the cushion, And as we come into the present moment with mindfulness, also just checking the quality of that mindfulness, the way we are aware, whether you can bring a little bit more kindness, gentleness, 
appreciation into your attitude, the way you relate to experience. As so though gazing at experience the way you would look upon a friend with eyes full of kindness, friendship and warmth, without judgment or measurement. Accepting them, accepting yourself, your experience, exactly as it is. So for those who wish to join in with the visualization or the imagination, just staying connected with your own body, your own experience. Imagine you're sitting on the bank of a river in a beautiful warm climate (coughs) under the shade of a large tree with no one else around. The only sounds are the rustling of the leaves, the very gentle breeze, which keeps your body the perfect temperature. You've had your meal and you've gone to the forest for the day's abiding. You're perfectly content. Imagine you're the Buddha sitting under this tree Understanding there's nothing else to be done. You've let go of all clinging, all wanting. You're fully content, fully at peace. Imagine how that feels. There's nothing left to strive for. No more wishes. Just absolute contentment. Acceptance of the way things are. What a relief.
no longer identifying with the thoughts that pass through the mind. With the feelings of pleasure, of pain, or of anything in between. Just understanding that these things arise according to their nature. Like winds in the sky. And pass away when those causes cease. There's nothing to cling to, nothing to push away, only deep contentment, understanding and peace. Your mind inclines to the silent places. To the places between the thoughts. Where everything's quiet. Everything's still. You can rest. The mind can really deeply settle down. Seeing the beauty in silence, the beauty in contentment, the delight in just a simple breath.
From time to time the old habits may arise in the mind. Maybe thoughts or concerns. But then you remember you're the Buddha. You no longer identify with these as a problem. Just aspects of nature. Not me. Not mine. Not a self. They're no longer a problem. You just allow them to arise and pass away. As your mind inclines to the silent places, to the simple beauty of the next breath.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. Just notice how you feel now. And see if you can appreciate even the slightest, simplest amount of pleasure, contentment, peace that you've developed in your mind. Contented and easily satisfied. With just the simple happiness of peace. 